On today's podcast, we sit down with a very special guest, Jessica Powell, CEO and founder of Audio Shake. This was a really interesting conversation. Jessica is the CEO of a company that is starting up that is designed to separate all of your music in a recording to its individual parts or stems as they're called. We discuss the origins of the company. We discuss the applications that it has for artists, especially in sync. And we also discuss the future possibilities that blockchain can possibly bring and how they, as a company, truly distinguish themselves from their competitors in the space. Insiders, are you ready? Welcome to Mubu TV's Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage artists and music business professionals who are dedicated to having a successful career in the new music industry. Here are your hosts, Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. Welcome back, insiders, to another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast, where our mission is to educate, empower, and engage your music career. On today's episode, we're with Jessica Powell, who is the CEO and founder of Audio Shake, a new AI startup that allows you to separate all of your music in a recording to its individual parts, or stems as they're called. We discuss the applications for artists to use the technology and sync, the future possibilities that blockchain could possibly bring, and how they distinguish themselves from their competitors. But first, a word from our sponsor. Hey, insiders. Are you looking to take your music career to the next level? Then you need to know about the Music Business Registry. The Music Business Registry is the leading music industry publisher of the most up-to-date contact information for major and independent record label a and music publishers, artist managers, music attorneys, music supervisors, and much, much more. The Music Business Registry is the trusted industry standard and source serving the music business community for over 28 years with the most accurate and up-to-date contact information available. Their titles include the a r Registry, the Film and Television Music Monthly, the Music Publisher Registry, and the Music Attorney Registry. All of their publications are available in print, PDF, CSV, or online subscription. Visit them now at musicregistry.com and receive a 10% discount by using coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. When you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Welcome back, insiders. Today's featured interview is with Jessica Powell. Jessica is the CEO and founder of an incredible new AI platform called Audio Shake. What they do is they create stems, which is the individual parts of a recording. You can take one of your recordings, your old recordings, like from a record, and it can pull the bass part, pull the vocal, pull the guitar, uh, pull the uh, uh, other instrumentation from it and provide you with instrumentation that you wouldn't normally get. It's a really, really really fascinating kind of service. Yeah, which is creating those stems. I mean, this interview I'm really I was really excited about because this had to do with me personally as an artist and for all of our, you know, musician uh, artists insiders out there, this is one interview that you definitely want to check out because this is an amazing platform and for those of you who may have not created TV track versions of your songs, this really gives you an opportunity to get those tracks together to kind of do things for music placement which you probably wouldn't have been able to do before because you wouldn't have had those instrumental versions. Absolutely. And it, it helps prevent you from having to go back into the studio and do them with this new technology. That's one of the great things about it. It's a fantastic platform. So with that, insiders, sit back, relax, and enjoy our featured conversation with Jessica Powell. Jessica, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks really for appreciate having me here. It. Jessica, really excited to speak with you and learn all about Audio Shake. Could you tell our audience what it is and how it works? Sure. So we are an AI startup uh, and we use AI to pull a song apart into its stems. So uh, the easiest way to think about stems for those who don't know is just the parts of the song. So you have the vocal stem, the drum stem. We also can create instrumentals on demand. Those aren't technically stems, but we can call them stems for the purpose of this. Yeah, I'm so excited about this platform because I was telling Rich when we were figuring out who we were going to get for this, this directly applies to me as an artist because a couple of my older records did not have TV tracks or mixes with instrumentals. So when I saw that this was available, I freaked out. I was like, oh my God, I got to like, like immediately try this. So. <laughs> Really exciting, and it's. I think it's exciting for a lot of artists that may not have that done to their music before, so that's really great. Thank you so much for joining us, Jessica. We really appreciate it. Um, who do you find are the most in need of what Audio Shake offers? Is it labels, publishers, independent artists, or, or who? who? 
Yeah, uh, all of the above. Um, okay. we, so we launched an enterprise platform last summer that for labels and publishers primarily for them to be able to create stems for their song. And when we first built the technology, um, it was sync departments that we originally spoke to because we learned early on that, again, it depends on the department, it depends on their catalog, but anywhere from 30 to 50% of the instrumental requests that would come through, or rather song requests, they wouldn't be able to fulfill the instrumental that, that, that the music supervisor, music editor was asking for. And so that those opportunities would just walk out the door. And so that, that was our first, our first customers were really sync departments from everywhere from the major label groups to companies like um, Hypnosis and Primary Wave and Concord, Reservoir, Peer Music. Um, and then word spread from there and we started to get A&R departments that started looking at it for remixes. Uh, we've done a lot of stems for spatial mixes and, and originally when we started, I thought we were largely going to be doing deep catalog. I, I assumed that, okay, certainly all, everything that's mono, things that were in analog, maybe the, ta the tapes are lost or they're damaged. Then I learned, oh, no, there was a whole transition to digital where a lot of that stuff was lost. And then I thought, okay, all right, everything post-2005, I don't know, was, is set. And then next thing you know, we've got all this, these requests coming to us for contemporary songs because there's still the problem today of either stems not being delivered or just like session files get lost or hard drives crash. And so what we, um, we just, uh, just a few weeks ago launched a platform for independent artists. And so that's called Audio Shake Indie. And we now have indie artists that we're able to serve as well. So it's a little hard to say who uses it the most because I think, and I think it makes intuitive sense, right? Across the industry, you would have this problem. No, absolutely. As I'm listening to you, I'm realizing that the growing market of independent artists that you guys are now serving with that new platform really seems to be, you know, that's very exciting because that's something more and more artists are controlling their own recording, mixing, and mastering, as, as, as uh, right. Eric mentioned. Right. You know? And Sync, I think, you know, for, for an artist today who's recording a song, uh, they, they, they probably will from the producer or the audio engineer, they'll, they'll bounce the stems, they'll get the instrumental um, quite a bit of the time. Um, but I think, you know, and I think there's much more awareness now today about the different uses of those stems and the different opportunities. But say just a couple of years ago, sync licensing was nowhere near as big as it is today. And so there wasn't that same knowledge or urgency perhaps in getting your stems after the song right. recording. So we have a lot, I would say the number one use case for indie artists um, is definitely sync because the, and the comparison there I think would be whereas on the label side, uh, there's a lot of uses like for example, spatial mixing. Um, that right now, I hope it's not the case forever, but right now that's, a, that's quite budget intensive to create a spatial mix. And so right. we don't, I wouldn't say we have a ton of indie artists coming to us asking for stems for, for, for spatial. It's primarily sync licensing. Interesting. Uh, how did you, how did Audio Shake come up with this technology? Was it by accident or design and how does it work? You know, I know you mentioned a little bit earlier how it's separating, but I'm wondering how the technology came about. Um, so I was living in Japan with my co-founder. We did a ton of karaoke. Um, <laughs> and, you know, the and karaoke in Japan is fantastic, but yeah. just like everywhere else in the world, you're limited to the same number of songs. There was like a lot of Brown Eyed Girl, a lot of Wonderwall. Which are great songs to karaoke too, but at some point you're like, please, can I do something else? And right. we really wanted to do old hip hop and old um, punk. And, um, and so we always had it in our heads of like, oh, what if you could just karaoke to all the world's songs? And not only that, the originals, right? Like I didn't, didn't, I didn't want to hear like a Gang of Four re-record. Um, I wanted like the original damaged goods. Um, and so, um, you know, that, that was always in our head. And then when we left our respective tech jobs, we started playing around with what could we do in the areas that we knew? Like, what could we do in music? Um, everyone on the team is a musician. Um, and so we really wanted to do something that was tied to music and creativity. And how could we help artists make more money for their, for their music. And so we played around with a bunch of different ideas and kept kind of coming back to this idea around like, well, what if you could actually break a song open? And it started with karaoke, but then we were like, oh, and what if you could, what if you could sample all the world songs? And what if you could do this? And what if you could do that? And as we were having those thoughts and started um, kind of researching the problem and, and started trying to develop models to pull a song apart, at the same time, we saw all of our friends or acquaintances in Silicon Valley, building all these really new experiences in gaming and in VR and in other spaces. 
And it started to dawn on us that, yes, like, it'd be amazing to have the original karaoke versions. It'd be amazing to sample all the world songs. But also, like, in a world where VR is going to become much more dominant, or rather, where we'll all it'll be much more accessible, I should say, um, the need for immersive music experience, so spatialized, immersive audio, that's going to be built on stems. And in social media, the ability to um, throw yourself into the music much more than you can do today, where you can be you know, um, interacting directly with the song or throwing yourself into the song, or maybe you're increasing the energy of the bass, but you don't know how to use a DAW. You're just doing it right. because all the new creator tools will make it so easy. Just the same way we now can manipulate video and audio. And, and just a final one, like on the gaming side, you know, gaming is going to be so cool from an audio perspective because today most of the music and audio experiences we have in gaming my character comes into the scene and that music is hard coded in. So I have the same piece of music every single time. And in the future, it's gonna be, that music is gonna change every single time unless I as the user have somehow said, no, I always want this song. That song is gonna change every single time I enter the room. And not only that, but the whole environment is going to be like audio enabled or dynamic. Like I might touch the wall and I might hear a part of that song or I might hear something totally different and it'll be unpredictable in a really wonderful, rich way. Um, and all of that is going to be based on being able to like atomize the content, right? To really pull things down into these small, like the, the building blocks of songs or stems. So as it, like these things were kind of happening in parallel as we were developing it and we, we got more and more excited about the idea. How does um, Audio Shake differ from its competitors in the space? How do uh, you distinguish yourselves? Yeah, a, a couple of ways. First, we have, uh, I hate this part because it sounds so salesy um, and I need to get over it. Um, okay, but we have the, we have the best tech. Um, and so we, there was actually a contest that Sony ran last summer um, to find the best, they called it demixing technology. You can call it demixing, call it sound separation. Um, and we beat, we, we won that contest. Um, and we beat big tech companies, we beat research institutions. Um, and uh, so we, I, I think quality is probably the biggest driver by far. I think we also have a different um, perspective on how to go about it. It might be the wrong perspective, by the way, but it, it's like a different, it's definitely a different approach, which is that, you know, um, I, I think what we've built is pretty cool. And I think it's really, it's super rewarding when you have like an artist who all of a sudden is able to open up their song, you know, or we've worked with like family estates where they're all of a sudden hearing the artist's voice from a, like a mono track recording that they're hearing like their father or their, their, you know, a relative, um, the way their voice was recorded in the studio in a way no one's ever heard. Like it's a super powerful and really, really rewarding thing at the same time it would be, I think, really disingenuous to pretend that when you have technology that can pull something apart, that all of a sudden that that can't be used for unfair ways to the artist too. And, and so, for example, the, the most practical way for us to have built a business, definitely the most profitable would have been just like build a piece of software, make it a plugin, let everyone use it. And, and just like everyone have at it. And so all of a sudden everyone can sample the OJs and the old Motown. And, right. and on some level, like the music lover in me thinks that's amazing. And I think it's inevitable and it's what's going to happen. But the other part of me is just like, you know, Jessica, that there's not all of the infrastructure in place so that artists are paid for all of that. And so it just seemed like a pretty crappy thing to do to artists to just have a fully open technology that... Um, that allowed some of those kinds of uses. And so our approach, I think, is pretty different. I'd say most of the other people in the space, um, or everyone in the space, it's, it's, an, it's, an, it's open tech um, that anyone can use. And, and it like pains me every single time someone who I know would make a great remix comes to us and wants to use it and everything, and, and we ours, ours is more closed, right? Um, right? Just because we would like to be a part of um, building the infrastructure or, or, or may, or I, we don't even have to be, we don't need to be the ones who build the infrastructure, but we'd like to see that there are more mechanisms in place to make sure that artists have more control over their work. What I find interesting about it is that you, um, you have this technology, but at the same time, I would think it, it could be used without an artist's permission. I mean, you remember the gray album? Mm -hmm. Okay. Which is great. Right. Like, I love Which it. Which was I love the, the white mixes, album yeah. right. and Jay-Z's black album mi mixed together. Mixes, it, it, right. it, it, um, what's his name? Um, uh, uh, the, 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 
Danger Mouse. Danger Mouse. Did yeah, this, Danger Mouse. And, and EMI, you know, put a stop to it, yada, yada. But I'm thinking technology like this really allows this now, you know, to this kind of thing to occur. And the creativity that you could get out of this, I think, just on a purely creative level, would be really fascinating. I, 100, which is why I'm saying it's so painful and why it might be stupid what we're doing. Like, I, like I, I can argue the other side of it completely, right? Um, not just the financial side of it, which is like, how do you actually stay afloat as a business when you're not letting people use your product? Like, maybe not. Like any business school would be like, don't do that. Um, but I think the, um, what I think will happen is I think that everything is going to be out there. Like everyone's stems are going to be out there. There are going to be so many creator tools and so many different ways that creators uh, will have their songs out there and so many more monetization opportunities. But today, in 2022, if we just look at remixes, right? Um, I think the long standing view, like for many years, I think people believe that remixes cannibalized, like from the industry perspective, that they cannibalized the original song. They didn't want to encourage it. There was also the artist component. Like what if the artist hated the remix? And so there really wasn't a whole lot of infrastructure in place to how remixers could get hold of say stems and songs to be able to remix them. And so they would go to different lengths to try and get those parts and then they would remix it anyway. And then it gets released. So it gets uploaded to SoundCloud or wherever it gets uploaded. And if, and statistically unlikely, but if you have a breakout hit, then the label might swoop in and claim that song, in which case the artist gets paid. Right. The remixer gets nothing most of the time. They're just like, hey, great job on this song, which by the way, you didn't have permission to do, but maybe you can produce something for us on spec next time, right? Like th that's the, your opportunity is that you maybe get discovered as, a, as the remixer. The vast majority of remixes though, are the artist isn't getting paid for them because they're not necessarily easy to detect right. from like a content recognition perspective. The remixer is not getting paid. Like it doesn't, it, it's, it's, not, it's kind of broken, right? Like, it, like I love, I, I love remixes and I think remix culture today or remixes today, I think are far more recognized by the industry as being additive, that they extend the life cycle of the original song, that they drive a time. I mean, TikTok is a great example, of course. Sometimes of this. they become bigger than the original. Uh, Absolutely. You know, right. Like the Conqueror. Yeah. 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 Right. Exactly. Um, there's a ton of examples of that. And so I think ultimately we will end up in a better place where there is, um, where the remixers are incentivized, the artists are also getting paid. And I think the same thing will happen with stems, but I just don't think it's there today. And yeah. so it just felt a little crappy to be like, No, and I hey, think that's great that you have that integrity come, come uh, as opposed to the competition, what they're doing. And, I, and it's funny because I think you have also the, the, on the other side, artists that are encouraging it. I believe probably about 10 or more years ago, Trent Reznor did that with one of the Nine yeah. Inch Nail records where he gave the mixes. I think they threw like USB things in bathrooms and people yes. were picking them up and going, what is this? And then he was encouraging people to remix the songs. So you have that part of it too, you know, but he was actually giving the stems. So it was, it was right. interesting. And I think a lot of artists are doing, you know, we, um, we've worked with artists. I think artists for the most part see it as a positive provided that they like the quality, right? I think for, for a lot of artists, it's, you know, particularly like the, we talk to a lot of um, managers Yo. and um, I'd like to pretend we talk to all the artists that big name artists are calling us up every day, but <laughs> usually it's the managers. Um, and they, uh, they'll, for them, like when their artists have issues, it's not because say their instrumentals floating around. If they have an issue, it's that someone like ripped off one of their stems or an instrumental and it was, the, like it wasn't a good one. Like it sounds really bad. It's full of artifacts or it's not the version that they wanted. Um, and for them, it is, like it feels almost like a, a brand issue, right? Like it's not there. It doesn't right. feel no, like representative of their yeah. art. Yeah. Right. Um, and so I think, I think that absolutely will happen where people will continue to release. I mean, of course there was Kanye's stem player, the right. Donda that released the other day. Um, I, I just think we're going to see more and more stuff like that. Hey, Insiders, we hope that you've been enjoying our featured interview. Stay tuned because we've got so much more value coming your way. But before we dive back in, a word from our sponsor. Hey, Rich, you're the founder, CEO, legend of Music Business Registry. Tell us what the Music Business Registry is all about. Well, what it's about, Eric, is it's a company that is designed to provide the most accurate and up-to-date contact information for the music business. So if someone is looking to reach the A&R community, 
if someone is looking to reach music publishers, if someone needs to reach artist managers, if someone needs to reach music attorneys, if someone's looking to place their music into film and television and needs to reach all the music supervisors. That's the contact information that we provide. We've been doing it for 28 years. We're sort of the industry standard, if you will, uh, for the music business uh, and, and have been serving them since 1992. So that's what we do. Amazing. So if I wanted to find out, let's say, uh, A&R uh, people from uh, Warner Brothers, let's say, I can just go in there and find that in the A&R registry? Absolutely. You'll find all of the Warner Brothers in there. You'll find the Warner Brothers in L.A., Warner Brothers in New York, Warner Brothers in Nashville, Warner Brothers in London, Warner Brothers, you know, probably in Australia as well. So those are the, the main territories that we cover. Amazing. And we're offering all of our insiders right now that are listening, if you visit musicregistry.com and use coupon code MUBUTV10 at checkout, you'll get a 10% discount off your first order. That's musicregistry.com, coupon code MUBUTV10. Anything else you want to say, Rich? Well, when you're ready to put your music to work, musicregistry.com. Can we talk about, I know you touched about it earlier, but I wonder if you can go into a little bit more detail. Can we talk about uh, Audio Shake's technology as it applies to sync? Because obviously that seems to be the big area of what, when Audio Shake started that you were getting a lot of requests from sync. How, how, how... Yeah, so we have an enterprise platform. Uh, though this, this, in this sense, it works the same way for, say, indie artists that are coming on to Audio Shake Indie. But uh, you would, if you have an account, you would come on, you upload your song. And you select your stem types, and you can pick vocal, drum, bass, guitar, piano, other, or you can have just a turnkey instrumental. So you just click instrumental, and then about 30 seconds later, you have the instrumental of the song. Um, and we've had, uh, we've we've been so we've been live, I guess, for six to eight months now, but they've been used in. Dell computer commercial, an Oreo commercial, uh, some Netflix trailers, a couple movies, a podcast. Uh, they're, they're getting used professionally um, quite a bit. And some of those songs range from songs from 2019. And other ones are going all the way back to like mono track, really old recordings, which is pretty cool to hear, actually. When yeah. you hear, um, it's always funny, too, when you separate it because you, um, you hear flaws in the original recording mm. or the unique characteristics right. of recording from that oh. time. Like I, we did one <clears throat> mono track the other day where you can actually hear the bass player flub a few lines, which was totally covered up in the mix. In the mix. Yeah. yeah. Um, so you have funny things like that too. Yeah. I love that. Cause it shows the imperfection of how it was today. Everything is so perfect and you're on a click track and everything has got to be like on the one on the, and, and th back then it was much more loose. And I guess that's where you're hearing all of those imperfections. Because they were done by real people. Right. P P um, it, there was a documentary called The Funk Brothers, which was all about the band that produced all of those Motown sessions from 1962 to 70. And they talked about this very thing that you just mentioned, which is that what made the Motown records, all of those records, so great was what you were speaking about. It was the human element and the mistakes. And the immediacy of it, right? Yeah, that, that, and, and there's tons of mistakes in those records, even though they're classic records, but that you would see, and because and it, it gets hidden in, you know, in the mix. I mean, you hear John Bonham's uh, a pedal squeaking in the classic Led Zeppelin songs. You could listen to it, and you hear like, weak, 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 and it's actually his drum pedal that you're actually, and that's from one of the most legendary, I mean, and great sounding bands yeah. of the time. So, yeah. One of the... Um, uh, I just completely lost my train of thought there. Oh, I, was about, like, I, was, I was going to say something really that I was really excited about what you were talking about. About the Motown like, mi yes. mixes and the making mistakes. It's and, gone. It's gone. Oh, it's okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right. Um, Jessica, can you tell us about any major artists that have used Audio Shake to create new versions of their existing work? Yeah, we've had, um, uh, so Green Day, I, I thought this was really fun. Um, Green Day so Kerplunk, I think, was recorded yes. in ninety one. I think it was one of their first, yeah, EPs. Yeah, yeah. and they um, they they lost all the master tapes for that. And so what they did was they took two thousand light years away, um, which is one of the most popular songs from that album, and um, created the stems and audio shake. And so they would have created uh, vocals, drums, bass, guitar, but what they did was they summed up the vocals, the drums, and the bass, and uh, and then added that to TikTok because in TikTok you can make it possible for your fan or your user to download the audio or rather to interact with the audio right themselves so that they could create their own version like a duet. So what they did was they provided the audio of the vocals, drums, bass all summed up 
And then Billy Joe played along live with the guitar. Uh, and that was the video of him playing along live with the guitar to 2000 Light Years Away. But what they did then was they released that vocal drum bass audio so that all of their fans who played guitar could then play along with the band. Which like the amount of time it just took me just now to explain that, which probably sounded way too complicated to the people listening, less complicated than it sounded. Um, that should not exist in the future. Like clearly someone should build like, I'm, I am a 16 year old kid and I want to learn to play the guitar and stairway to heaven. And I like, right. like how exciting would that be? Like, I remember learning to play the bass to like Fugazi's waiting room and like, and just, and it's not a particularly difficult bass line, but I remember like over and over just hitting like, like on the CD, just trying right. to pick out the, the, the stuff and like, and it could be so much easier, right? You could just pull everything apart and then listen to it. Um, so Green Day did that. Um, Madian, the French producer, uh, just like a week or two, I saw him, uh, like post to Instagram that he was using it um, live, like on tour because he didn't have his whole setup traveling with him. So he was creating stems. Uh, and then I had a chance to talk to him where I was like, what, what are you doing with other stuff? Like he reached out to us before to use it. Um, like I said, you can't just sign up for it because um, his, his content, a lot of it is major label. Um, but uh, what he was telling me too is interesting was that he was able to listen to the song in new ways. Because of course he has all of his stems for the most part, I think. Right. Um, and, and they're like, you know, gold to him. But when you hear the song broken up, you know, there's a difference between like the raw, like the dry stems and, and how it sounds. Like you can, you can hear new things, I think, when you pull it apart with um, AI, because it's not going to necessarily break it apart into 30 stems. It's going to break it into like seven or eight. And so all that becomes a little bit different. Yeah. Wow. Wow. I mean, it's, it sounds so fascinating to hear it from that perspective. Uh, you know, I want to go back to something that you had said before, which I thought was so interesting is, is about the area of monetization and, you know, not ripping off the artist is blockchain and what that represents for the future payment of artists. Is that a possibility of integration at some point? Maybe we're not there yet, but at some point in terms of using a technology like yours and making sure that the people who are involved get paid. I mean, you gave an example where, you know, the artists wouldn't get paid, the writers, the, the remixer, but where a blockchain, perhaps technology, could make sure that using something like yours for a new version could get paid. Uh, yes. Um, yes and no and maybe and, and all the things. Um, I think that what is interesting about blockchain with respect to music is of course this idea of a transparent ledger. So for, I think it might, would be difficult probably given all the data issues for historic recordings um, that might be difficult to really get an authoritative view and then record that on the ledger, so to speak, and make sure that it actually is totally accurate. But you could for forward looking music, you could theoretically start everything right there with, you know, right from the start with like the correct data. And then you would have it all in a place that's accessible to everyone and dis it would resolve disputes. That would not, so I think that is an interesting potential future use case. There's still other pieces of it though that would have to be solved because just because something's on the blockchain doesn't mean you get paid, right? right? Um, and a lot of the things that people talk about that the blockchain will resolve could actually be resolved. If, if they can be resolved, they could be resolved today too. So for example, if you talk about, if we, if we were talking about remixes, right? Okay, great. So you have, you, you've recorded that this song belongs to this person and then another person has created a remix. Um, that, that doesn't, so, so if someone creates a remix and Bob's song, all the rights are there and they create a remix of that song, but there's nothing that inherently connects that node <laughs> to like how that song, that, that remix that ends up in some totally different place. Um, but that would be a problem today too. So I think, you know, where, where it could get interesting is if you perhaps had a closed environment where everything, all of the information, like where creation is happening, where distribution is happening, where consumption is happening, if that was all happening in the same place, then that, that kind of tracking would probably be easier. But it brings up other issues too, because do you necessarily want everything that's happening around creation happening in one place with one company, despite all the ease and convenience that provides, it introduces other issues. So I think, um, I think the blockchain is generally very interesting. I think we haven't seen all the things that will come of it. And I'm generally like pretty excited about it, even though, if, even if I think that a lot of the stuff that's happening right now is it might fall away. Like, I think something interesting will come of it. Well, it's interesting listening to you because it, it sort of makes me think of the question, are you discovering other uses for the technology other than what it was designed for? Yeah. Um, so 
And so, like I said, we came from a, a place of like, please want to karaoke more stuff. Um, but uh, we've discovered, for example, that our model works really well for, um, for speech separation, for example. Um, so separating uh, dialogue, um, which is of interest to, say, music supervisors or people working in film. Um, it also can work really well for um, their denoising and other kinds of technology. We haven't um, released anything yet, but um, those are all things that the tech, some, in some cases, the existing models. So, for example, the, in, like the instrumental and vocal models do fine on dialogue uses, too. What's next for Audio Shakes Evolution? Uh, then immediate next. So, like I said, we had the enterprise platform. Now we have the platform that's open for uh, indie artists, Audio Shake Indie. And then uh, we will, uh, this month, be releasing an API for third parties. So, well, third parties. Uh, that could be something like music libraries, for example, that want to be able to create stems for all their tracks. It could be a uh, music service that is, you know, something that's licensing that is wanting to provide um, stems or instrumentals. Um, and, and various kind of uh, services that are built off of, you know, karaoke, of course, is an, another example. Finally, we'll get to karaoke. <laughs> um, but I think that that's the, our immediate next is, is we're still working on just trying to get stems in the hands of people who need them. Jessica, are there any books or films that have really resonated with you, professionally speaking, that you could recommend to our audience? I, so on the, I feel like people will know these. I really enjoy the podcasts like Song Exploder and Switched on Pop. Um, I love hearing artists talk about how a song came about. It's always so different from what you think it is or what the meaning of the song is to them is usually so wildly different from what was in your head um, and how that intersects with composition, I think is really, really interesting. Um, and then I'm working my way through the m music business tome that everyone tells you to read, which all of a sudden I'm forgetting my name. But if I said it, it's like how the music business. All you need to know about the music business. Yeah, it's like, it's yes. so huge. It's so yes. huge, but I'm working, I'm working my way through it. It's very good. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jessica, what advice can you offer our listeners who are wanting to pursue a career in the music business? Uh, so if, if we're thinking of music tech, perhaps. Um, I mean, I think the, the, the biggest thing is to read what's going on in music tech uh, to perhaps understand what the opportunities are. Or if you're wanting to join, if you're not wanting to start your own thing, but joining a company, I think that um, looking, you know, reading what people are doing is probably the best way. Um, it's also the best like form of, I think, hunting for companies, right? Because a lot of the companies in music tech are, you know, they're not going to be the size of Google. They're, they're going to be small like us or growing. Um, and they're not necessarily going to be spending a lot of money on recruiting and advertising. And so the best way to find out about them is to, I think, read the publications that write the most about music tech companies. So I would say, while it, um, I feel like a lot of people in the industry, uh, there, there are a lot of... Um, publications that, that people, and they'll, they'll cover tech as well. But I think some of the ones that, that if you're really looking for music tech coverage and that will, will also profile companies or talk about companies uh, in the very early stages, I think Music Ally is a good one to read. I think Digital Music News, um, uh, those two in particular, and then there's some others too, I think really uh, do a lot tied to startups. And so they're a great um, if you just get their digest mails, I think it's a great thing to scan if you're looking for a career because you'll, you'll, you can then go and go to everyone's career pages and stuff. Jessica, where can people best connect with you and AudioShake? Uh, so we're at audioshake.ai. Um, and if you're an indie artist, just going straight to uh, indie.audioshakeai, so AudioShake Indie. Um, and then I'm on, uh, like we're on, we're on all the platforms as one must be at audio. <laughs> it's just at audio shake AI, AI. Uh, and I'm at, uh, the Moco, which is a very weird handle, but from like when I was a kid, uh, on Twitter. Jessica, thank you so much for coming and joining us. We really, really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thank Thanks you. so much for having me. Thank you. Wow. Th this was an interesting conversation and I'll tell you yeah. why. It's not often that we get to talk to people who are CEOs of real cutting edge technology that can serve our audience and, and, and really be bringing something new uh, to the table right now. Yeah, no, I mean, this one I was excited about. Obviously, I told you several times because on a personal level for me, it, it, it was something that spoke to me because this is a problem that I actually had with one of my previous recordings that I never had these TV tracks done. I never had instrumental versions. So when we were first researching, you know, Jessica for doing this interview on the podcast, I was so excited about the platform because this immediately spoke to me and I'm sure several 
uh, of our uh, listeners out there that have never had the opportunities to get their music stemmed uh, properly and get instrumental versions where they can go back and try to pitch to music supervisors or try to get their musics into film and television. So I think it was a really, really great uh, feature that uh, this this platform has. Absolutely, Eric. And, and the, the thing about it is that this is something that you used to have to go into a studio and specifically request from, right. from the engineers, you know, and it's extra time, it's extra money. And now it's so demanded from you that, you know, if you get a song in film and TV, the first question they ask is, can I have the instrumental? Exactly. Can I have the stems? And you need to be able to provide that stuff immediately. Right. That's the thing. And what she talked about with independent artists using it for sync, I thought was really an important point because that's the usage that independent artists have for this technology. Yeah. And some of the other uses, which some of these older catalogs of music that they were talking about, that the record labels were going back, this was creating new revenue streams for them. And you, you had a band like Green Day that had their first record, which, you know, was like 20 plus years ago. They never had those instrumental versions, so they were able to go back and do those new versions and now have a new opportunity to be able to do whatever they wanted with, the, with that music. Absolutely. And, you know, the, the origins of the company, I thought, were really interesting. Um, just, you know, the way that it, it, it started with, you know, karaoke and figuring out, you know, different kinds of technology on, on how you could do that. And her idea of, well, what if we could do karaoke of the original versions Right. of these songs. And that was the impetus to how this all started. And that makes this a very, very interesting technology that I think all artists should really know about because it's really valuable to their careers today. Hey, insiders. Thanks so much for tuning into this episode. We really appreciate it. To get show notes, links, and everything that was mentioned during this interview, head on over to our official website at mubutv.com forward slash podcast forward slash show notes. If you're enjoying the content and what we're doing here on the show, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Spotify, or wherever you listen to podcasts from. And don't forget to rate and review our show over at iTunes. Five-star reviews are always welcome. Welcome and help to ensure that our podcast stands out on the top rated and new and noteworthy charts on iTunes in our space. You can also find us on social media at Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, all ending with the handle Mubu TV, which is spelled M-U-B-U TV. Don't forget to catch our flagship show, the Mubu TV Insider Video Series, airing every week on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash Mubu TV. This show was produced and created by Rich Ezra and Eric Knight. This show would not be here if it weren't for our amazing team, which are the following. Interview editors, Sarah Nissenbaum and Alex Taylor. Show notes and transcriptions by Jani Chang, Nicole Caboteglou, Lilia Owens, and Sarah Nissenbaum. Theme music by Disciples of Babylon. And be sure to tune in next week for another episode of the Mubu TV Insider Podcast.